I'm reading from the NIV. It's the old version of the NIV, so it's fairly okay. <laughs> and uh, I find it just a bit easier to read than the, than the King James when we're in this setting. But um, we're going to be looking at Jerusalem, a cup of trembling this evening, because I'm sure with what's going on in the Middle, of e Middle East at the moment, you'll be perhaps have many questions about what's going to happen. But of course, the Lord tells us everything in advance. So Zechariah chapter 12, starting at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation, foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Ju Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a brazier in a woodpile, like a flaming torch among sheaves. They will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honour of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one that they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him who grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The clan of the house of Levi and their wives. The clan of Shimei and their wives. And all the rest of the clans and their wives. May the Lord bless that word to us this evening. So tonight we're going to look at Jerusalem, a cup of trembling, a cup that's going to send the nations reeling. Well, Jerusalem and of course Israel has been in the news rather a lot lately. I'm not quite sure why, uh, but uh, you, you would certainly um, think that they were up to something, wouldn't you? But we have seen them in the news uh, a lot lately because of Gaza but uh, this, this week we have seen them in the news for a different reason and that's because of their turning towards Iran or Iran has certainly sort of tried to flex its muscles as you might say and uh, I think it's very interesting that God protected Israel using other people as well uh, from over 300 missiles and not one of them uh, managed to cause any harm and then Israel in retaliation. Uh, and we, we know now, looking in hindsight, Israel could have wiped out Iran in one blow, really, I think, the other night. But it chose to just land two missiles in a, a very um, interesting place right next door to their nuclear facilities, just taking out an airfield, uh, and basically said, if you want any more, come on. Uh, they've laid down the gauntlet, I think you'll say, but they have done enough to show Iran that they're not in the same league as Israel is. But of course, Israel has got that secret weapon, hasn't it? God on its side. And uh, although there is a lot to be uh, still to happen out there, um, we know that 
time is running short. The, the rapture is coming and the, the Lord will come again and uh, take Israel, those that are left, uh, to be his people. Well, Jerusalem, of course, is one of those capital cities. In fact, I would almost say it's probably the only capital city that has had such a checkered past that this one has. You know, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, whether we like it or not. I like it personally. I think it's the proper thing. But there are many in the world that don't recognise Jerusalem as Israel's capital. uh, And they want to take it away. They want to divide it up. And that's nothing new because we've seen that throughout history. Mahmoud Abbas took it to not only the EU and the UN, he wanted Jerusalem to be recognised as their capital, but it wouldn't be done. But it is split at the moment. Uh, It didn't need to be, but Israel, if you like, in their kindness after the 67 war, gave back uh, parts of it that they didn't need to. The UN now is looking at Israel again. I'm sure that they will be looking at uh, Jerusalem itself. Of course, a few years ago, we had uh, Jerusalem thrust into the uh, news with President Trump saying, I'm going to move the embassy into Jerusalem. And of course, that caused quite a kickback, didn't it? And yet there are a number of other countries, probably small countries, but there are a number of countries that followed suit. Unfortunately, the UK wasn't one of them. But never mind, uh, we can still hope, can't we, that uh, we see the light in that respect. But the question tonight then is, is why is Jerusalem as well as Israel such a a problem? Why does the Bible tell us that it is going to be a a cup that will send the nations reeling? What's so special uh, about this place? Well, I want to to start by giving you some of the history of Jerusalem and how it came about, how it came to be the capital of Israel, and uh, then look at some of the prophecies about Jerusalem, some that have been fulfilled, some that are still to be fulfilled, and then, uh, well, we'll bring that to a a conclusion, and hopefully you will have a a good understanding of uh, why Jerusalem is the place it is and the problem it is. So despite what the media will tell you, Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel and has been since King David made it his capital well over 3,000 years ago. So it's got a history to it. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and been to the the city of David part of it, you'll see all the evidence is there, even though everyone tries to deny it. And... um, you know, it's there, but it was never called Jerusalem at the beginning. But there are there are names, if you like, that we can put to it that sound very similar to it that come out of different texts. For instance, the um, the execration text, as they're called, of the Middle Eastern, sorry, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, that was around. Um, 1900 years before Christ, so that's nearly 4,000 years ago now. Uh, they called the city Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, although it's um, not necessarily everyone will say that Jerusalem was actually Jerusalem, but there is uh, a good chance that it was. Uh, and then in uh, Armenian letters uh, going back to 1330 BC, there there was a slight change uh, in name. It was called Jerusalem, with, beginning with a, a U. So you can see there's a, a similarity there. The name Jerusalem it means, or is believed to mean in the Sumerian text, foundation. It means foundation. It means to lay a cornerstone. And isn't that what God did? He laid a cornerstone in Jerusalem. He put his name there. And that was going to be his name. So we can say that that may well be a, a true statement there when we call it the cornerstone. After all, if you look at the map of the world, Israel is bang in the middle of the whole world. Uh, And I think that's a deliberate thing, personally, by God. Um, If we go to the Bronze Age, uh, we will see that um, the the people of that time called this place Shalem. The Shalem. And that was named after their God in the Bronze Age times, Shalem. So you can see that the name Jerusalem has had links back to at least three or four thousand years. The form Jerusalem or Jerusalem, which obviously is what they call Jerusalem today, first appears in the Bible, actually, in the book of Joshua. 
And uh, according to the Midrash, it's a combination of the name Yahweh and Yireh. Yahweh and Yireh, Yireh in, which really means God will see to it. And uh, of course, it is the name that Abraham was actually given, if we look at it properly, uh, where he was going to sacrifice his son. He was going to Shalem. And uh, of course, we know that he went to Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah is right in the smack centre, as you might call it, of Jerusalem. There are many other writings as well that date back, which uh, show that Jerusalem has been there and it's always had a Hebrew foundation. There is an inscription that says, I am Yahweh thy God. I will accept the cities of Judah and I will redeem Jerusalem. Uh, That comes out of some of the old Hebrew um, writings. And uh, they suggest that Yahweh is the God of the whole earth. The mountains of Judah belong to him, to the God of Jerusalem. So even in the ancient Hebrew text, they called God the God of Jerusalem. It's where he is. It's where he placed his name. It's where his temple uh, was, of course. So it's got quite a history. Shalim or Shalem was the name of the God of dusk in the old days in the Canaanite religions. Um, It seems to me that they had a God for just about everything. It's, uh, let's have a god of dusk. That must mean we have a god, god of daybreak and stuff like that. But Shalim or Shalem was the god of dusk. And they have a, a root meaning there, the S and the L and the M, which the Hebrew words quite often are made out of the same letters, uh, mean or make up the word peace. So Shalem is, or has a meaning or uh, comes out of the word peace, um, which of course... Uh, Many people greet uh, people with peace, don't they, these days? So the name Jerusalem has quite a history to it. Judges 9, 19, verse 10 says, But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went towards Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. I'm not going to go into the whole story of that, but it's just to know that there has been different names for it, but it's the same place. And uh, it's also been known as the Fortress of Zion. And, uh, of course, David renamed it as the City of David a long time ago. And, of course, I suppose for us the well-known thing that we would probably all think about is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. And, of course, that is the place where now Jerusalem is. And of course, Melchizedek being the great high priest is none other than Jesus Christ himself in Genesis 14, verse 18. And if you read that story of Melchizedek, it's very interesting how Melchizedek brought out to Abraham bread and wine and stuff, obviously pointing to what we would call the communion today towards his death and things like that. But that's another story. So Jerusalem uh, has a long history. And it has been called many times. In fact, during that long history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times. Um, It has been captured and recaptured 44 times. You know, it's almost like you keep your baggage in the van just ready to go back out again because you're going to lose it soon, aren't you? If you were one of those that was um, after it. It's been besieged 23 times. And by that, I mean they've laid siege to it. There have been long campaigns uh, to, to, um, to, to, to take it. It has been totally destroyed twice. Uh, The oldest part of the city was settled back in the fourth millennium, so 4,000 years before Christ, making Jerusalem one of the oldest cities in the world. Very interesting, I think, that uh, this city is that old and uh, has become uh, what it is today. Of course, the city of Jerusalem is far bigger now than what it was originally Uh, It was quite small originally when it was the city of David, but it has grown beyond belief. In fact, uh, it has now grown so big that it covers seven mountains, seven hills. Um, They wouldn't call them mountains the way we would call a mountain a mountain, but they are over the thousand feet, all of those hills. But seven uh, seven hills, um, which I think is quite interesting as well. It's also a city that's important to three major religions. 
Uh, of course, Judaism is important. It's very central to Judaism because of its links to Abraham, because of its links to King David. I suppose it's quite obvious because um, Solomon built the temple there as well. And uh, the temple is where God dwelt. And you remember when, when they consecrated the temple that Solomon built, God came down. Uh, and um, inhabited the, the temple. And it's also very uh, interesting and um, sad that in the book of Ezekiel, when you look at the book of Ezekiel and, and all of the, uh, the, or the majority of the people have been carted off by the Babylonians, but they'd left a remnant there. Uh, and that remnant was doing things that were disgusting in God's sight. God didn't like it at all. And he said, I'm going to bring uh, another a group of people against you. I'm going to bring my wrath against you. And all the way through Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel gives them these little pictures that he's told to do. You know, he's told to make this thing that looks like Jerusalem with a ramp up it. He's told to put sticks together. He's told to lay on his side. And all these things were supposed to convey to him the coming wrath of God. And they just went, yeah, but that's in the distance. That's in the distance. And they never took any notice of him until... All of a sudden, of course, God's wrath did come. Uh, and it's interesting to note that before that wrath came, God sent a man in there with uh, pen and ink to mark people, people who were still faithful to God, a remnant of people who were saved when the others were killed. So it's got quite a history, but it's very important to Judaism because of those links. Of course, Islam would claim it to be theirs. Uh, they consider it to be a, a sacred site. But I gather in, the, in all of the um, Islamic texts, Jerusalem actually isn't mentioned, which I find quite interesting. And yet it's one of those, those places. It's supposed to, I believe, be the place uh, at the Alaska Mosque where um, Muhammad on his horse flew up to heaven or something like that. And that makes it um, very significant for them. And so they go and pilgrimage there. So, um, you know... In their traditions, it's very important to them. And of course, they have taken Jerusalem a number of times when the Crusades were on uh, and some other things like that. But you see, in their belief, Muhammad is the prophet of God, the messenger of God. And uh, he was the one in their eyes that said God should be worshipped through, um, through prayer and listening or reciting God's messages which were obviously written by him uh, and things like that and so uh, it became quite one of their sites the Dome of the Rock still there today you you would think wouldn't you with the palaver that comes about over the Dome of the Rock that the Dome of the Rock if you went in there would be a really plush place it would be well decorated but it's not it's covered in rubble it has been uh, almost torn apart. They don't take that. It's there just to show so that the uh, Muslims can come and say the Dome of the Rock is ours. They don't, they're not really interested in it uh, at all, I believe. But it has become what you would call a pillar of Islam uh, that you need to, to go there and, and sort it out. And then, of course, it's important to us as believers, isn't it? As Christians, the Christian tradition. It's, of course, the place where Jesus died. It's, it's the place which surrounds the Old Testament. It's the place where the temple was. And all these things are, if you want to call it, sacred to us as Christians. It's the place where Jesus rode into on his, on, on his donkey on that, uh, on that day. It's, it's the, day when he, the place where he cleansed the temple. It's the place where he had the Last Supper. It's so important to, to Christians and of course, it's the place where he was resurrected from the dead. And uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to go around Jerusalem and see the sites, uh, it's well worth going. They're not all, obviously, the proper sites, but at least you get to see what Jerusalem was all about. So it's got quite a history to it. And it's important to many people in the world because of their, their religions, no matter what we think of them. And there are many prophecies in Scripture that concern Jerusalem. In fact, Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible over 800 times. And uh, as I said, it's built as a city on seven hills. And uh, throughout the course of, of biblical days, um, it has grown and grown and grown. In fact, it used to be a walled city, but now it's a city that is unwalled. 
And of course, that becomes quite prominent in the last days, doesn't it? Let me just give you uh, some prophecies about Jerusalem. In, In 2 Kings 21 verse 7, it says, In this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Forever. There's something eternal about that, isn't there? Um, It means that God will not take his name from it. He will not give his name to somewhere else. That name is in Jerusalem forever. The psalmist also tells of how God looks upon the city, the city that has his name. In Psalm 122 verse 6, we read, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. I wonder what that means when we ask God to pray for the peace of, of, of Jerusalem. Because it will not know peace. It will not know peace right through the tribulation. So what are we actually praying for? I think that when God says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, or the psalmist says it, he's saying pray that God will come back to Jerusalem. That Christ will return. But that's open to to speculation, I'm sure. Psalm 125 verse 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. You know, I I don't know whether you've heard on the news, they don't usually put much out there, but you hear through different media how God's hand has been on Jerusalem over these past a uh, few years with all the rockets flying. I did hear one story, a true story, of how the Iron Dome, uh, I won't say it failed, but I think at this time they were reloading or doing something so it wasn't operationally ready. And a missile was coming across and they could track where it was going to go and they believed it was going to land on the hospital in Tel Aviv. Uh, well, of course, that would have caused a lot of devastation and so they were just watching and getting ready for the bang if you know what I mean and and a huge wind literally came in and pushed the missile off course into the sea you know God's hand I believe at work uh, over that place Psalm 147 verse 2 also says the Lord builds up Jerusalem he gathers the exiles of Israel And then, of course, a verse that we know so well, don't we, in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We all know that verse. I'm sure we know it well, of course, because every year we spend a Sunday, don't we, looking at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There are things that have been said about Jerusalem, but what about prophecies that are still to be fulfilled? Some interesting ones. In Joel, for instance, in Joel 3, verses 17 through to 21, we read, we read Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will follow foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of the Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. That can only be a prophecy for the future because we know uh, from what it says that those things have not happened yet. Um, You know, foreigners are still invading through missiles and and, uh, other means. Although we see uh, Israel is, is a land of milk and honey, It's not doing what it says here about the mountains dripping with new wine, the the hills flowing with milk, the ravines running with water. That's still to come. We don't see Egypt yet desolate. We don't see Edom a waste still to come. So there is much more to happen with Jerusalem. It's going to go through uh, a rough time. But Judah will be inhabited forever 
and Jerusalem through all generations. The world goes on its marches, doesn't it? Uh, you know, and telling us, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, let's let's sweep them away. Let's do away with Israel. Let's let's create a two uh, two state solution that will get rid of Israel because that's what it will end up doing. Um, but Israel is going nowhere. Jerusalem is going nowhere because God has his hand upon it and he has promised. He has promised that it will be inhabited forever. Forever. And of course, that means that during the millennial reign of Christ, the Israelites who come to know Jesus will be there and they will be worshipping him in Jerusalem as well. It's a future prophecy and uh, we will one day see that being fulfilled but I believe that that prophecy will only be fulfilled at the beginning of the millennial age when, when God brings his wrath upon the nations and he allows them to live in peace. In Micah chapter 4 verse 1 we read, In the last days the mounting of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. I will be exalted above the hills and the people will stream to it many nations will come and say come let us go to the mountain of the lord to the temple of the god of jacob they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nations will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore very interesting that it talks about the lord's temple this is not the temple that will be up and running for the tribulation period or halfway through that's not going to be the Lord's temple. It may be built by the Jews, but God is not going to inhabit that temple. That will be given over to the Antichrist. So this will be a fourth temple, really, won't it? This will be a God's holy temple. It'll be a temple that he builds, I believe, uh, and that people will come up to and will exalt his name as people stream to it during the millennial reign of Christ. In Zechariah 1 verse 14, we read, Then the angel who was speaking to me said, Proclaim this word. This is what the Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty, Almighty will be called the holy mountain. It's certainly not a holy mountain or a faithful city at the moment. But one day it will be. One day everything that is unholy will be gone and God will return or Jesus will return to Zion. And then, of course, Zechariah 12, which we read at the very beginning, uh, says much, doesn't it? A prophecy, it says, the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth and who forms the human spirit within a person declares I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Notice that it's not because of the amount of weapons they have or the army they have. It's because the Lord Almighty is their God. And on that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile like a flaming torch among sheaths. They will consume all the surrounding peoples right and left, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. Well, that prophecy is certainly one for the future, isn't it? But as it started to come to fruition, are we seeing the chess pieces coming together, the convergence of these things upon the nation of Israel? After all, we could probably say that verse 2 uh, is beginning to be um, fulfilled, where it says, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends the surrounding peoples reeling. We had in this past week, haven't we, the UN have been coming together uh, to decide what to, get, what to do. 
uh, with with Israel and, and um, you know the Israelis of course state that this is our land and the Palestinians will claim it to be their land and there will be many in in, uh, in the middle somewhere going well I haven't got a clue whose land it is but I'm going to support the Palestinians uh, which is what we see unfortunately on our streets at the moment the Pope wants it to be his he wants Jerusalem he wants to be in charge of it the UN has many times voted on Jerusalem and they don't think it should be Israel's capital they think it should be a separate entity uh, that is governed by the UN or someone that is not Israel or, or otherwise well it's good that people like Trump did recognize Israel's capital as Jerusalem but they are few and far between at the moment but it is certainly becoming a city that no one really knows how to deal with you notice that everyone who tries to come against Israel, who tries to divide the land, who tries to divide the city, always end up worse. The countries that do that have God's judgment upon them. I think it's uh, probably quite well known, really, that every time the Americans try and put forward something that will split Israel into a two-state nation, God seems to send a hurricane. Um, if you look in the in, and Google it, you'll see every time there is a meeting. If you notice when they had the meeting in France a couple of years ago, France got flooded. You know, it's like God is saying, listen to me, you're not going to do anything with it, even though you're trying. In verse 3, we read, On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. Has this happened? Well, we don't see the armies coming together, but we do see the nations in the UN coming together. I wonder if that's the start of this, that the UN nations are all plotting against uh, Jerusalem and, and Israel. And... Um, you know, it might be the start that sets all of this going. But one thing is for, for sure, uh, Netanyahu maintains his line that Israel is there to stay. He's not moving. And it, and it is good to see someone standing against Biden at this time as well, regardless of what Biden is saying. Biden is not a trusted ally, I don't believe, anymore of Israel. They may be sending them um, arms and things like that, but I wouldn't trust Biden to... Uh, well, he's done it already, hasn't he? He's abstained and done things that he shouldn't have done in the UN as an ally. Um, so I, I think Netanyahu is very wise not to go along with everything that Biden says. So although armies are not against her, the nations are coming against her. So we definitely need to keep our eye upon Israel, don't we, at this time? Uh, not only for what's going on there now, but for the future and for the fulfilment of prophecy. Has Israel become a firepot among the sheaves? Well, uh, I think so. I think that again is, is causing, they're trying to get the fire going, aren't they, with all these nations round about. Um, it has become a firepot. We've got Hamas on one side, we've got Hezbollah, we've got Iran now, all stoking themselves up. Uh, it won't be long, I'm sure, before Egypt gets involved and probably even Jordan. And then we'll see uh, perhaps something like Psalm 83 coming to fruition. I've had a number of people uh, ask me if Psalm 83 is, is happening right now. Well, if you look at the nations that are in Psalm 83, uh, one, of, one of them is, is not Iran. So Iran uh, can be discounted, but they're not all there yet. But I think we're getting close. Um, to, to Psalm 83 being fulfilled but we'll have to wait and see uh, let's not jump the gun with God God's perfect time and of course will always be the case so there's a lot of speculation going on at the moment whether um, you know Trump is is using the nations to um, sort of awaken Israel as it were to himself that they would realize that it's not all about them but it's about him and uh, he certainly is on on Israel's side and uh, he has been protecting them, that is for sure. So what happens next? What happens next? Well, Zechariah, who was a prophet uh, of God, was also given this prophecy in Zechariah 2, verse 1. It says, Then I looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, Where are you going? He answered me, To measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. 
And while the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him and said to him, run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. What a wonderful prophecy that is. Well, we know that Jerusalem now is a city without walls. It's outgrown its walls. Uh, and there are a lot of people there. It is a huge city now. And uh, we could say quite clearly, I think, that the Lord is that fire around it. He is defending them uh, and he will show his glory, I believe. So we must watch that in the future. In verse 6, he goes on to say, Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape you who live in daughter Babylon. For this is what the Lord Almighty says. After the glorious one has sent me against the nations and have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye, I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. You know, I, I believe this conflict that's around Israel at the moment is awakening Jews in the countries around the world. And they're saying it's now time to go back home God is calling his people home he's getting them ready and he said I will not leave any behind they will all come home and we are seeing that aren't we we are seeing Jews from around the world who are very fearful of living where they are you know it's it's a really terrible thing to think that Jews are scared to live in this country they are fearful of their lives in this land of ours it is such a thing and yet God is saying come back home Come out from amongst them, go back home. <clears throat> Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit, will inherit Judah as a portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. What a wonderful verse that is. Be still before the Lord, all mankind. He's about to show, I believe, uh, in, in the days that lie ahead, that he's going to show his judgment of this world. He's going to reclaim his believing church. He's going to rapture them to himself and then seven years later he will come back and he will judge the world and uh, place himself upon that throne of David once again. So despite what history has done to Israel and Jerusalem, God has not changed his mind concerning them. His promises are ever sure. They are still his people. They are still the apple of his eye, despite what they may do, despite what you may think of them. Uh, again, that's God's grace, really, isn't it? Uh, and Jerusalem is the place where he has placed his name forever. That will not change. Nothing will change that. And yet, the, the bit that's still to come is that they're going to go through a devastating time. Zechariah, again, in chapter 14, says, A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the house ransacked and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for, I will ex for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones will with him that is clearly something that's going to happen in the days of the tribulation 
there's going to come a day when although God is looking after his city, he is going to allow the nations of this world to come against it, to break through into it and unfortunately plunder it and rape the women and ransack it and carry people off. And right in the midst of when they think that perhaps God has abandoned them, when they think that things could get no worse, God acts. God comes and he fights against those nations. And we know that when he fights against those nations, he will wipe them out. He will judge them ferociously as he does on the day of battle. And he will save those people that are left and they will be his people along with us as the church. Uh, will be with him and he will come and he will stay and all things will then of course be made new Jerusalem is the immovable city because God put it there and God has set his name upon it the nations today are now starting to reel because of it they don't know what to do with it they don't know how to deal with it it is now centre stage a day does not go by when Israel is not in the news for one reason or another. And yet the Lord has also been very gracious in keeping his promise that all those who bless Israel will be blessed. All those who curse Israel will be cursed. You know, we have been blessed throughout the whole world has been blessed by the Jewish people. It's incredible how God has blessed us through them. But the world is preparing to come against Jerusalem. Things are going to get bad for them. But the Lord will fight for them against the nations. And he has the victory. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, will come with his armies. What a sight to behold that will be. I believe that from scripture, the peace of Jerusalem will only come when Christ comes to reign. And I think that's what it says. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you are praying for Christ to return. You are praying that he will come and bring that peace to Jerusalem. And so I believe that's what we're praying for. And the only thing that we can do today in praying for them is to say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Keep an eye on Jerusalem. It's the centre of God's world. And as the word says, he will do it. He will save them from the nations and he will judge the nations in his time. Amen. Amen.